The subject of this evening's presentation, SDI update, is well known to all of you, as is our guest this evening, General James A. Abramson. Let me briefly remind you that our guest is a graduate of MIT with a Master of Science degree in uh, uh, aerospace engineering from Oklahoma University. He was an Air Force astronaut. He served a combat tour in Southeast Asia. He was manager of the F-16 program. And he was director at NASA of the Space Shuttle program before assuming his present post, which as you know, is uh, director of the Strategic Defense Initiative Organization. Without further ado, so that we might enjoy the, the uh, expertise and wisdom of General Abramson on the uh, subject of SDI update, let me present to you General James A. Abramson. I'm not sure what this tape recorder is really here for, but uh, that's fine. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm really very, very pleased to come here. And of course, this is the first time to begin to uh, have an opportunity to talk to this particular council. Uh, and we talked to quite a few councils around the nation. And I find that uh, this is obviously groups of people who are uh, very, very interested, very knowledgeable about many subjects. Uh, and I'm just very pleased that all of you would be interested uh, in this particular subject. By the way, uh, you know, Washington is a place where there are many ills, uh, and unfortunately I have uh, something of one of those, and I may not get to the whole evening. I might run out of voice. Uh, then I'll probably uh, resort to some of the signs that some of the people have outside. Uh, it's very difficult, I guess I really ought to say, there is nothing as impotent as a general who cannot talk. I can assure you that. It is really, really bad. Uh, but I'll try my best and hopefully uh, be able to get through and answer some of your questions. Uh, you know, you are far enough from Washington that you ought to have the right perspective and not be subject to all those ills that, that we sometimes have down there. This is probably the most misunderstood of all of our various programs, and I have a very difficult time understanding exactly why, but we do our very best to explain it and to enter into what has certainly become a national debate with people from all levels either being skeptical, in some cases having very sincere uh, but, but uh, very potent criticism of the program, some people being just ardent advocates. Uh, and that is difficult to conduct a program in this kind of a political atmosphere. But nonetheless, it is appropriate that we have a national debate on what is the best way to ensure the survival uh, and the best way to ensure that we prevent a nuclear war in the future. So therefore, I think that this is a uniquely American way of proceeding with a program. Uh, and that's part of the responsibility is to try to explain it. And so that's why uh, I do spend time doing that uh, and trying to deal with all of the questions that people have. And you have good questions. Uh, and, and by the way, we learn from some of those questions and there are important attitudes and uh, important kinds of things that we bring back. So this isn't a one way kind of a conversation. I really hope uh, that what we truly will have tonight is a dialogue. Uh, I started the dialogue with some of the people who are protesting outside. Uh, and, and I often have protesters there. And, it start, and there was a lady there with a, just a lovely little child. Uh, and I went up and tried to introduce myself to them. Uh, some were more friendly, some were, were less. But she did, I think, the right thing. She held up her baby and said, I want to ensure the future of my child. And that's, of course, what we're really talking about. What is the best way to do that? And of course, that is the kind of thing that is only subject to human judgments and human projections about what kind of a world we live in today and where will it go tomorrow. And that's, of course, the question mark uh, and the reason 
that we have to be able to project ahead and be willing to think through new ideas. And in order to talk about the future, I believe that probably it's worthwhile to go back and review what could be a very dismal kind of subject, and that is to go back through the history, at least of the nuclear age, uh, and how we have tried to secure our protection during that time frame. Now remember in the beginning, we started out developing the atomic bomb, but obviously our adversaries in World War II were also trying to develop the atomic bomb. Fortunately, we were ahead, but we also unleashed that particular genie that uh, has been a curse ever since, uh, as well as a blessing. And nobody really thinks that it's a blessing, but we've used it in many, many ways. In the beginning, we had a clear nuclear monopoly. And in those days, the strategy or the condition of the world was one in where John Foster Dulles could explain and outline an, uh, an approach to diplomacy that was, a, was an approach of massive retaliation and in fact, he could say that we would use our nuclear weapons because we had this clear majority in order to ensure that we got our way in the world, not to intimidate other people, but certainly to prevent them from intimidating us or from taking territory or infringing on the freedom of the freedom, the people of the West. And it didn't work. Our nuclear arsenal did not prevent the, the situation in Berlin. Our nuclear arsenal was useless to us when freedom-loving people in Hungary tried to revolt uh, against, the, against the, the domination of the Soviet Union. And in fact, fortunately, we haven't used it. And fortunately, we haven't had the kind of a crisis that we might have to use it, even though some people felt that clearly the, the Cuban crisis was an approach to that. But fortunately, we haven't had to. Now, some people will say, well, that is truly a tribute to the strategy of retaliation, and maybe it is. On the other hand, I'm not sure that it has ever been really challenged or really tested in a way that it could be in the future. Because even though we have moved through the nuclear age, it hasn't been a peaceful age at all. It has been an age of conflict, an age of conflict at many different levels, but nonetheless an age of conflict against adversaries who clearly have very different objectives than we do objectives that were expressed very well by Khrushchev when he said, we'll bury you. Now, fortunately, we've been able to withstand all of that. And the nuclear weapons that we devised in the first place had some advantages for us. The Soviet Union has military forces, conventional military forces, when they add them to those of their Eastern European allies that outnumber us in many places in the world, but particularly in Europe, by tremendous ratios. And we have adopted a strategy for Europe and for our security where we have not had to pay so much. We have not had to match tank for tank and plane for plane because we had a nuclear force. And in that sense, it allowed us to have security at a lower price, a lower dollar price. But we paid a terrible price. And that price was a continual escalation in the number of weapons that were made up our nuclear deterrent. Uh, by the way, I, I tried to talk to some of your friends outside, uh, and, and I understand that you would like to be seen, and I appreciate the way you're, you're coming in. Perhaps if somebody could provide some chairs, you could sit in front. And we get, when we get to the question part of this, uh, we could give you a five-minute session and you could come up, come up and not just show a sign, but, but, but uh, state your position and we'd be happy to do that. 
thank you for coming in in a way that's not disruptive. Thank you very much. Perhaps we could have some chairs so you don't have to stand during the entire thing if you'd like. Okay. If you were, I don't know if I may. Yes. Um, the council has certain rules which we try to put forward. We invite a variety of guests to this particular forum from a variety of points of view in all nations of the world. And we accord them the same pattern of, uh, of respect while they're speaking. And one of our rules is that we indeed do not have banners in the room. And so I, I will have to ask you out of courtesy to the people who are here to uh, put the banner down and perhaps do as the general said and take a seat and join the audience, if you would, please. What is courteous is that we not continue to build nuclear weapons that threaten the human family. Oh, We'll, we'll do the five-minute thing if you'd like, okay? Thank you. Okay. Um, I would ask you one more time, if you would please uh, be courteous to the audience, uh, take the banner down, and let the uh, general proceed with his remarks. Would you please? Okay. So the, cr the price of the nuclear weapons was a nuclear arms race. And we've spent a great deal of money for that. And so has the Soviet Union. And we tried a rather magnificent experiment back in 1972. I think a uniquely American experiment, by the way. One that is the kind that is hopeful, believes in people, and believes in reason. And that was the experiment where we proposed to the Soviet Union that they have, they join us and try to by agreeing that we would limit the development of defensive systems against their nuclear arsenal, we would create an atmosphere, an atmosphere where they would be guaranteed that their deterrent force would never be challenged. And what the hope was at that time is that with that kind of a guarantee, reason would finally prevail on both sides and we would be able to limit the total number of nuclear weapons to something reasonable, to something that was a small number. Well, that part of the, of the hope has not worked. And what has happened has been the continual invention of MERV systems on both sides, the growth in the number of nuclear weapons. Until today, we are facing a number of ballistic missiles from the Soviet Union aimed at the United States on the order of 8,000 warheads. That's enough to destroy every meaningful military target as well as the civilian targets in the United States three times over. They face about the same number of nuclear weapons from the United States, around 8,000 or so, uh, primarily in the form of ballistic missiles, we have additional ones that are in the, the bombs and in some of the cruise missiles that are available. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, about an equal number, but there is a very significant difference in what has happened to the amount of destructive power of those two arsenals. The Soviet arsenal, since the signing of the ABM Treaty, has not only grown in the number of weapons, although the weapons have gotten smaller, it has grown totally in terms of the number of what we call equivalent megatonnage, the destructive power of those systems. The United States, on the other hand, perhaps because we, can, we could make them more accurate uh, earlier, drew down uh, in terms of to the point now we have about 25% of the equivalent megatonnage that we had back in the days of, uh, of 1972 and when we signed that treaty. Nonetheless, the Soviets are faced with a tremendous number of forces from the United States. I believe that what we tried was a wonderful experiment, but it hasn't produced the re results we want. Now, many people will say, well, let's continue to try, and that's wonderful, and I, and I won't challenge that kind of an issue. Not yet. Uh, but nonetheless, what the President said in March of 1983 was let's recognize that history and let's see if we can't change the playing field a little bit. Let's see if we can't find 
another way, a new strategy, a new technology, something that will change this playing field so that we can stop this escalation of, of these particular weapons that are the most destabilizing and what we think are certainly the most dangerous because they can be dispatched so quickly and can be destroy so much of the world, not just the United States, in a very, very short period of time. And so he outlined a series of questions in that speech, and he didn't say, let's go to war in the heavens, and he didn't say, let's build lasers or anything like that. What he asked were rather three straightforward questions, in a poetic manner perhaps, but nonetheless they were, isn't there a better strategy than the strategy of holding each other hostage in terms of ensuring that we can prevent a crisis from developing into a full-scale nuclear attack of some kind. He said that uh, by saying, isn't there a, is, wouldn't it be better to save lives than avenge them? But that was really a call for a different strategy. But a strategy by itself is not sufficient to be able to truly provide protection or truly provide a way in which uh, we can preserve not only our people, but the ideals that, we're stand, that we stand for, uh, and preserve our allies who rely on us for their protection as well. And therefore, we had to find the means to be able to implement such, such, uh, such a strategy. And he said, can't we find a way to make ballistic missiles obs impotent and obsolete? And what he really said there was, let's find a counter something that will take away the military value of these weapons, the ones that up until this point in time have been the only weapons in all of the history of mankind that have been considered the ultimate weapon. And therefore, let's take away the military value. And that's what the research program, the technical side of the research program is about. Frankly, that's the easiest part of this program. The political side is much more difficult uh, and as difficult as any is the strategy side, really thinking through is there an alternate strategy and isn't there a way that that can be made real and made uh, affordable and really give us protection. And we're working on that which is a subjective problem just as hard as we're working on the technology side of the program. But right from the start, he also felt that this must be a total strategy. It has to be the kind of a thing that embraces arms control as well. And regardless of many of the newspaper accounts that really build on the suspicion of individuals in the administration, what he called for, and people forget that, the third question was, and if the technologists can do this, can't you, the arms control community, get rid of the weapons themselves? Now that's a logical three-part program. The answers were not certain, and therefore he didn't say, let's go deploy this, and he didn't say, we know we have it in hand, but he did have enough faith in American technology, and perhaps more important than technology, which is some kind of an inhuman thing, faith in the people who create this technology, our free society, that he said, this is a worthwhile endeavor to see if we can find a way to change it, not necessarily in the short term, certainly not merely for his administration, certainly not even for the next administration, but so that we can try to achieve a better degree of stability and better guarantees of our survival for decades to come and into the next century where we cannot predict what the political situation might be, where we cannot predict what the Soviet Union will do or perhaps other kinds of adversaries who might develop and become strong and develop the ability to deliver nuclear weapons in devastating blows against a society. Uh, and we cannot predict, certainly, the political situations or the growth of technology. So it was a question and the responsible way to proceed was to create a research program. And that was allowed under the treaty. And so we started out to do exactly that. 
We have not had to deal with defense in this nation. For a while, we did. We flirted with it. We had an air defense. We had over 2,500 fighters out uh, because the Soviets were starting to build bombers. And at the time we signed the ABM Treaty, we also realized that they will destroy our nation with ballistic missiles so fast, so quickly, that we're spending unnecessary funds for the air defense of the nation. So the only thing we did is we kept a large number of radars for warning because without warning we would not have had a credible offensive deterrent to respond. What have the Soviets done? They've continued to build offenses. We have had to react to that. And they have continued to build defenses. They have the world's only operating ABM system. Clearly, it is limited at this point in the number of launchers to something less than 100. And in that sense, it conforms fully to the limits outlined in the ABM treaty. But it isn't a crude system by any means. And they have upgraded it with modern radars that when they are fully in operation will be the basis for them being able to have not an SDI type of system, but a system which will be a two-layered defense that could, if they choose to, I'm not saying they will, none of us know what's in the Soviet mind. None of us know how they will respond to what they see coming, happening in the world, but they could, if they wanted to, by building more interceptors, they could have a very effective uh, partial defense of the Soviet Union over a major portion of the Soviet Union. It probably would not be sufficient to stop a nuclear first strike from the United States. On the other hand, it could be a very effective defense against a ragged retaliatory blow from the United States. And when you combine their tremendous investment in passive survival activities, where they've spent something like 200 to 300 billion dollars, by our best estimates, to have shelters across the entire Soviet Union for the leadership of the Soviet Union, and to protect their, the thing that they feel they must protect, the key elements of the Red Army, uh, then uh, that's a massive investment in defenses, passive defenses there, but matched by investment in offenses as well, and certainly matched by, and uh, more than matched, in defense, in uh, uh, ballistic missile defense, as well as aircraft defense. Now, you can say that's because they perceive this threat from the United States, and yes, they do. Uh, but nonetheless, they have been willing as a society to make that kind of investment, and we have not. We have relied on offensive-based deterrent. Now, in the history of, as I said, in the, it's, it's worked in the nuclear age. But in the history of warfare, it hasn't always worked. In fact, if you look very carefully at the beginning of any war, any real war, you find an element of irrationality, how that started. And I think perhaps the most analogous situation to the one that we're talking about in the nuclear age is World War I. How many here had a, um, an elderly relative or knew somebody from World War I and was able to talk to them about that? Just, just let me get a feel for that. A few. How many think they know how that war started? They're coming up slowly here in the process. Uh, you know that I've got a trick, you see, coming right afterwards. Well, many people will say it was the assassination. But, but logically, at, does the assassination of one person, and one person is, is the most precious thing we all, any of us, have in any society, but does the assassination of one person, does that logically justify a course of action that takes all the nations of Europe and Eastern Europe into this terrible war that killed millions of people, and does that explain how it really started? I don't think so. I was talking at the Ecole Polytechnique, the, one of the important schools in Paris, and outside the auditorium was a, bush of, a bust of Marshal Foch, 
who was the commander of the French army in 1914 and the, most, the commander of the most powerful army in those days. His statement was, and the belief not only of his army but every army, was that offense will provide the best means of protecting their nation. The ability to carry the war to the other person's territory was the right way to protect their country. In fact, the way Marshal Foch put it was, the French army no longer practices defense. They only know the doctrine of offense. And there were similar statements by the head of the, the German general staff and by the British. But they had a new technology and something that the military did not understand. They had a rail net that was serving the civil economy and serving it very well and rapidly. And for the first time in history, they were able to mobilize an army and rush it to the front at tremendous speeds. And my feeling is, and some military historians I'm sure will agree with that, is that what happened is that we had an event in a tense situation, in a crisis. They mobilized on all sides. They started those armies rushing towards the front, and it was out of the control of human beings at that point. There was no way that the leadership of one nation could credibly call on the telephone or talk to the people on the other side and say, forget the fact that I've got an army headed towards your border. Don't worry, we're going to stop at the border. Let's stop and think about this before we decide to get into this terrible series of events. That kind of, of activity cannot happen in the nuclear age. It cannot be allowed to develop through any kind of a sequence. And there's marvelous sequences. On television, I guess in America, they have one version of, of one of these sequences. There's all kinds. But we cannot allow that kind of thing to happen in the nuclear age. Therefore, it's reasonable to say, is there a better strategy? The strategy that we're searching for and we think makes sense is something called defensive deterrence. I, an idea that says, we will not threaten the other side as we do with our offensive forces. But what we want to do is preserve our own capability and deny the other side the ability to say, I can reach my military objective. That's why the structure of SDI is to try to say, let's build layers of defense. Let's try to stop a missile if it's on the way not in the last few seconds before it, it, it goes off over a target in the United States or in Europe or anywhere amongst our allies, but let's try to stop it when it's just getting started coming out of a Soviet silo or coming from a mobile location anywhere in the Soviet Union or bursting out of the oceans from some hidden submarine. Let's try to stop it there because that's the most efficient. If we, just, if we could stop a Soviet SS-18, their monster missile, which is the backbone of their forces, we could destroy not only that missile before it's armed, before the nuclear bombs would go off, but we would destroy at least 10 warheads, maybe more. And at a time if they started to deploy decoys and those kinds of things, you could destroy many of the things that would make your defense more difficult later on. You would never in any time, in any place, be able to stop everything with a single layer defense. You're putting too much weight and too much reliance on the perfect operation of one part of a system. So what do you do? You put a second fence up. And you put that in space, and then you put a third fence up in space, and a fourth fence up in space. And the intent is to have that Soviet head of the strategic rocket forces Marshal Malenkov, you want him, no matter what the crisis is, to be forced to look at those series of layers of defense and say, I will never know which missile that I have aimed for the first layer will also get through the second layer, will also get through the third and the fourth. You want to give him a probability problem that gives him an absolute level of uncertainty. So no matter what the crisis, no matter what the provocation, when a military man, a responsible military man, is turned to by his civilian leadership and say, 
what is your recommendation? All of the rest of us want him to be able to only say one thing, don't do it, don't strike, because I know that I just cannot guarantee to you that I can achieve the military objective. And that is defensive deterrence. A different way, other than threatening the other side, to try to deny them any certainty that they can do any good. Now, there has to be an element of punishment, but it doesn't have to be ballistic missiles uh, and, and for deterrence to really work. It can be our other forces, can be other elements of risk in the world, but nonetheless, there is an alternate form of deterrence, and that's what we're exploring. Can that be made to work? Is it really credible? And what kind of technologies will make that credible? And that's why we're doing research into the kinds of weapons that will destroy other weapons, not people on the ground, certainly not instruments of mass destruction, but certainly weapons that can reach out at very high speeds and destroy missiles, best of all, in the boost phase. But then recognize they'll, some will get through and try to destroy them in other elements as well. Now, what you hear about is lasers. But actually, the program goes well beyond that. Most of the money does not go into weapons. Most of the money goes into fundamental technologies. And some of the technologies are the kind of missile technologies or things that we know how to build now, and we're just trying to make them inexpensive. It'll never be inexpensive. Let me say affordable uh, is a more <laughs> credible description of what we're talking about. Uh, make them small. And you probably hear in the newspapers now uh, a discussion of what we call space-based kinetic kill vehicles. Let me just give you a description briefly of that. All that is is a missile about as tall as I am that you put in a garage in, in orbit. And it's sitting there with maybe 10 or 12 or 20 or 25 in that garage just sitting there. It would go very, very fast. It would have a small front end. It does not have a nuclear warhead. In fact, it wouldn't have any warhead at all. All it would do would be to destroy the missile by crashing into it at very, very high speed. We've demonstrated that we can do that. We did that in June of 1984 from a rocket that we fired from the ground. But what we demonstrated was that with a very large machine, by the way, 2,500 pounds, that we could come at nearly 25,000 miles an hour closing velocity and hit a target that big and pulverize it and destroy it. So, but we didn't need a nuclear warhead. That was a major advance. That was a, a statement of the kind of guidance systems and sensors and uh, technology that we could build. But that was old technology, and we couldn't afford to put those up. So our work is to create small miniature circuits small miniature rocket motors, find ways to make them in production cheap enough that the nation can afford an option of this kind. Because if I brought, or my successor brought to this president or the next president, uh, a option that said it's the cost that some of these uh, organizations, like the Council of Economic Priorities have said, $780 billion, that's not an option at all. That's not going to make any of us safer because the nation couldn't afford it. So we have to, in the research program, spend money to try to bring the cost of these options down. And we're doing that. We're doing it in a very, very dramatic way. We're also making progress in some of the more exotic technologies, the laser technologies and things that reach out at the speed of light and destroy a ballistic missile. We don't know that we can do that yet, but we have made very, very great progress. But every one of these weapons are weapons that are optimized to destroy ballistic missiles. They are aimed at weapons, not people. Now, I, I really have trouble understanding why so many people object to that. Maybe it's because they're skeptical that we can do it. That's fair. But is it worth an investment of several billion dollars a year less than the, than the defense, at this point, less than 2% of the defense budget to see is there a better strategy. 
We're getting benefits from this kind of a program right now today. For the first time in the history of arms control, we have American positions on the table, and the Soviets have Soviet positions on the table that really represent a reduction in the size of the overall nuclear arsenal. That's never happened before. Why? Part of it is SDI. It's not all SDI. Part of it is the clear resolve of the people of this nation to ensure that we can have a strong military force in many dimensions, including restoring our offensive force today, because SDI is something for tomorrow, not today, to give the president and Max Kampelman and all of the people who are doing negotiating, to give them an opportunity to have the leverage so that they can negotiate. Now, many people will say, we had a wonderful opportunity in our hands at, at, uh, in Iceland, and that's true. On the other hand, I think that it's naive to believe that a, a problem that has escaped our negotiation ability for three decades could be solved in two days in Iceland. I believe, and, I, and I'm an optimist, that the right way to look at Iceland is that we made progress, we didn't make enough, we didn't make it properly, perhaps, but we are on the right track and we just have to continue to hope and work for exactly that. And SDI has a role to play. Now, some people who just are not convinced think it ought to be a role of a bargaining chip. And that would be one legitimate role. But what is a bargaining chip? A bargaining chip is something you put on the table, you trade it for something, and then it's gone, and you never use it again. You can never use it for continuing leverage. I believe that the president sees it, and many of us who uh, understand what we think the real potential of this technology and the new strategy might be, that it's much better to have it as a lever, that you don't use once, but you use time and time again. And hopefully, the problem that we have to deal with will be reduced through arms control, so we won't be facing 8,000 warheads. And we're as interested in that as anybody else because it makes the SDI problem easier and simple. Uh, and therefore, I can assure you that unlike some of these economic estimates that assume that there is some kind of a generic SDI, that it has to have 200 laser battle stations, and this, regardless of the Soviet threat, that it will really be something that will be tailored to what we see on the other side. And if we can persuade them through our total strategy to bring down that threat, it will be less expensive. It will be expensive, however. There is no question about that. But it won't be the kinds of numbers that the Soviets have given out or some of these, I believe, unreasonable estimates are there because we just won't be able to bring responsible options forward, and that's the case. We'll just keep working on the technology till we get there. Now, there's a great deal of confusion about because of the progress that we've made. We have made just incredible progress. And people have been confused about the program. And Congress, as well as the President, said, let's do planning for the next phase. Let's begin to think through how we deploy such a system in the future. And that's what we're doing right now. Now, unfortunately, in our day and age, we just, you know, nothing is private. We can't look at options, and therefore it comes right out in the Washington Post every day uh, or in the other kinds of papers every day. And, uh, and there are concerns that if we outline how early something could happen, which isn't a decision, isn't a policy point, but we say that that's, that's the limit of an envelope in order to provide information so people can make intelligent decisions, then there's a big scare that that says we're about to deploy. The Secretary of Defense puts it properly. We're not doing this research just for research's sake. We're doing that to make the nation safer. That means someday we have to be in a position to deploy. We'll deploy only what we need to counter a threat. Hopefully that threat will be reduced through our overall efforts. If it's not, however, we have to have the technology to deal with even a robust threat because otherwise the Soviets have a veto power over our system, and you can't allow them that. 
then it's not a negotiating lever. But we will only put what we need to up, and we will put it up when we're ready. We, will put, we, will, we should be prepared to make that decision and make it properly within the context of the treaty, in the consultations with the Congress, in consultations with our allies, and, and we've guaranteed to do that. Now, there are other controversies associated with the treaty, and that's a difficult problem. Obviously, the treaty is a piece of paper, and a piece of paper does not make us safer. It only makes us safer if it truly changes the behavior on the other side. And you should only have confidence in that changed behavior if you know exactly what they can do, and you know that they can't surprise you, and you know that they just can't march out and quickly do something very dramatically different. And therefore, their past record is an important part of the process of having confidence in arms control negotiations. Surely, as we re-looked at the treaty some time ago, the legal people on both sides in the State Department and the Department of Defense, and there are a lot of people who, who may not agree with that, and I understand those, those lawyers argue all the time. How many lawyers are here, by the way? Uh, not very many tonight. Maybe we'll get through the question and answer period. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> there's always arguments on both sides. But nonetheless, it has been determined that that is a legal right of this nation. And by the way, the Soviets are exercising as much of a legal right as we are, but they have an advantage that we don't have. The Soviets know that we abide by our treaties because we're, ours is an open society. The best verification system they have is not their satellites coming overhead, but it's the Washington Post and the congressmen who don't agree with what we're saying and Aviation Week and all of these kinds of publications that are part of our society. And, and I'm not putting them down. That's part of our society. But that gives the Soviets confidence in what we're doing that we do not have in what they're doing. And we have to recognize that. And therefore, we ought to not only deal with treaties and understanding those things from our viewpoint, and we have to be true to what we believe and what our society believes, but we also have to look at it from what their point is and what real verification really means. And that kind of an evaluation is going on, not so much in terms of the treaty, but in terms of how could the program be properly structured so that we are ready to go into the next phase. There is no decision at this point, and, and I don't know when such a decision might come. However, what is happening is a periodic evaluation of exactly those kinds of issues. What can we do? What should we do? And by the way, we are discussing that. We're discussing it with the Soviets, and we have been in Geneva. We're discussing it with our allies, uh, and we're discussing it with Congress. Maybe not always in a timely way, and it's difficult when there are 535 members of Congress to discuss it everywhere. But nonetheless, we, we are trying. And we will do that even more so as we go through the normal cycles of testimony and explain those kinds of things. It's just unfortunate that it's being tried in the press at this point, and the press does not know exactly what we're doing as we look at options and we look at the proper kinds of, of, act, of uh, ways to structure such a program. Well, I've talked now quite a while. What I've tried to say is why we're doing the program. I've asserted that we're making a great deal of technical progress. We don't have the final answer yet, but I can assure you the technology people in this country that are dedicated to this task, the creative free people out there, are working at a tremendous pace and they're really doing some marvelous things. And some of those people are right here in this room. And they are making progress. We don't know the final answers yet. It's wrong to judge a research program in the same way that you judge an aircraft carrier uh, procurement or a tank procurement or something that we've talked about and know and understand and built before. We should talk about what will finally happen but we should also evaluate what's going on now and how we're getting there, not just try to assume what the final answer will be. I believe it'll be a hopeful answer. I believe it'll make our children safer, just like the lady outside who was worried about the safety of her grandchildren. 
I believe that we will be able to find a way to do this appropriately without destroying the American economy and maintaining the proper balance of our important resources. And there is a balance. We can't put all the money in defense. There are many human programs. And in fact, weapon programs are not the final answer. And I think all of us know that. The final answer are human answers. And we have to search and we have to continue to work for those human answers. But we would be naive to think that we can abandon our technology advantages or our resolve to remain free and to make the kind of investment that is necessary to remain free between the time that exists now today when we have these differences in the world and the time when the world really does achieve the level of human understanding that will allow us all safety because we're all members of the human family. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. and I had a, an, a, a very civil argument with academician Velikov uh, in the uh, Congress of the United States in the House uh, restaurant about exactly that. But the way he put it was slightly different. He said, if one side develops a perfect defense and has an offensive capability, isn't then something that, aren't you in a position to be able to strike and destroy the other society without fear of retaliation? Well, that's a very interesting construct, but it is not a realistic one. The realistic one, and the one that we all hope for, is where we can indeed agree that we can reduce the number of offensive weapons. And as we begin to reduce those offensive weapons, we build up uh, in defensive capability. Surely, a Russian military man who is the equivalent of our, of, of myself and other people in the, in the American forces who is concerned with the protection of his nation will do precisely and have to think that through. By the same token, we must think of it in their context and remember that we're not building Trident II uh, or these kinds of systems unilaterally. The Russians have built their forces and fielded a new offensive weapon system every three years in land-based ballistic missiles alone. They've done similar kinds of things in submarine-launched ballistic missiles, although not quite every three years. They have invested in defense and are investing in defense. They are very practical people. They know what they're doing. Surely they have to look at our side and say, if they did not have an equivalent program, it, that uh, we might be trying in, to get in a position to do exactly that. I believe the gentleman uh, on the left was next. The microphone on the first. Yes, you, sir. A, pr a proposal has been raised by a member of Congress, in fact, it's uh, Representative Jack Kemp, that under the ABM Treaty, that just as the Soviets have their Galosh system surrounding Moscow of 100 launchers, that he suggests that possibly the United States exercise its rights under that 1974 protocol and, and, and put out our 100 last-ditch system, so to speak, yes. around Grand Forks, North, North Dakota, and, and provide a, a first layer to this, 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 this sanctity. And, uh, 
and protect not only a, a, a noticeable part of our deterrent from, from uh, first strike by the Soviets, but also a significant population of the North Central United States. And that create and build on from that. Your response, sir. Well, first of all, I'm from North Dakota, and by the way, there are not a lot of people up there. <laughs> uh, Representative Kemp and others have made that argument, and there are there are merits to the argument. There's that's clearly merits to it. Uh, however, what you have to ask is: is it really an important step along the way for what we're doing, and or would it be a diversion of resources? Now. Terminal defenses have a certain characteristic, and I'd like you to think that through. If we put 100 interceptors, which are the terminal variety, they only protect a certain radius that the Russians can calculate, their normal response would be to say, well, all I have to do is put 200 warheads in there, and I can achieve my objective. So that the real uh, motivation that you provide is one that says, uh, let's kind of increase our forces. You're not fundamentally trying to change the strategy. The merit is not in stopping there. The merit, and I know some of the congressional proposals are, let's use that as a first step and then go beyond. The, the problem is you're diverting resources from being able to go more directly beyond that. But, but that is being debated and will be debated, uh, and I don't know what final answers will be. Nonetheless, the feeling is that we only have a small amount of resources relatively. Uh, for this effort, and we ought to try to go as directly as we can to the layered system so that that can really cause a fundamental change in strategy. A critic then would probably say, well, wouldn't the Soviet response be the same thing? If you put up your layers, won't they try to multiply their force? Won't they have a tendency to do that so that they can, in fact, uh, maintain their ability to coerce you or to threaten you with their offensive forces. The difference is you're not dealing with one layer. You're dealing with many layers. Now, I know nobody in this audience makes a little side trip up to Atlantic City and, and gambles up, up there, I'm sure. I won't ask for a show of hands, by the way, in that particular one. But I can assure you nobody, even somebody who might be inclined to go up there, would go and spend your money on a gambling table if the only way you could win is not to roll one seven or one number, but have to roll seven sevens in a row. That probability is so low that you would just reject it out of hand and you say, that's crazy. Well, that's the problem we're trying to give the Soviet targeteer. So that it isn't just a matter of adding a few, counting the number of interceptors you have on the ground and then adding more missiles. In fact, he has to add hundreds of warheads as he begins to find a way to deal with restoring the confidence that he can destroy the targets that he wants. So that provides a motivation that says, my, you're really taking away the military value of these systems. The response of the cavalry, let's go back to World War I, the response of the cavalry or the armies of the world when they invented the machine gun, and the, the machine gun was no boon to mankind, but it, what it did do is that nobody bought more horses for their cavalry. Uh, they, they really said, we better find something else. We better go in another direction. It did make cavalry's impotent and obsolete, although the United States Army now is buying pack mules again, which is a little different, uh, but for another purpose. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to change the strategy. So therefore, as we consider each of those proposals, and many of them do have merit, we try to think of it in terms of the longer term objective and how to get there as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I have two questions. <clears throat> They're related. Star Wars is the most expensive and technically complicated undertaking that man has ever started. To be effective, mm -hmm. as the president has said, and he's guaranteed that it will work. <laughs> I don't believe. I believe he said that we should search for it. No, he said he took me in the television eye and said, "I guarantee <laughs> that it will protect you. It must work perfectly with the first time 
without ever being tested. So my first question is, give me some examples of military devices that have worked perfectly the first time they were ever tested. Something like the Sergeant York. <laughs> the second question is... Oh, that first one is pretty good. <laughs> Let's talk. How are you specifically planning to use past experience so that Star Wars is not a Sergeant York or a challenger over Good question. The only I example that I can think of the, of a weapon that worked perfectly the first time was David's sling against Goliath, by the way. <laughs> first of all, the president gave us an objective to work to. Uh, and I, I have to go back and challenge the precepts of your syllogism. Uh, because I don't think they're right. Uh, nonetheless, I understand the drift of, of, of where you're going and why, uh, and why that we've set a demanding objective. Thank you. Thank you.